soon. Uh, but perhaps we'll discuss it maybe at a later stage, uh, an open discussion uh, that we can get a chance to discuss about the net experimental method. So uh, Joe will comment on that as we go along. Uh, but the key issue in the, the selecting design will be uh, the method needs to be robust. Uh, and it needs to take into account the project budgets and the constraints. And, uh, and it has to be also understanding the operational context and the real world, uh, the social, political economy, and social economic context of the project. Uh, those are some of the, the issues, but uh, we will discuss this issue uh, really later also. And then, of course, uh, we discuss about sample size calculation with the uh, she produced a number of concepts about sampling in population in the standard level and how one can compute the sample size, which is a primary predictor for the budget of impact evaluation, right? Uh, the sample size is the key determining factors and how much we spend uh, on impact evaluation for a given project. So it's very important that we do a lot of time on that. And she discussed a number of factors that I want to take into account. And then Marcus uh, uh, gave us a case study on the Zambia case. I think the key from uh, Marcus' presentation is on the real-time monitoring aspects of uh, data, uh, behind collecting data at the baseline, and line, but uh, high-frequency data collection on the project cycle, and then how that could inform uh, uh, delivery of a, a project uh, in terms of implementation, and inform uh, the project managers and implementers as we go along. And then finally, uh, Adrian introduced us to the implementation tracking system and we break out and discuss uh, the whole uh, of our discussion. I think in, in five minutes, that's the short summary of the yesterday talk, I'll stop here. So uh, we could go to our first keynote address, uh, which is Jerry, the keynote address, I mean, and I'll give it to uh, you. Um, so I'm going to show you a list of words. All you need is a pen and paper. 
Um, <laughs> I'm just going to give you a memory test. Sounds like a really fun way to start the day, isn't it? And I apologise for anybody who's, uh, but almost everybody who's working in a second language because uh, this game is a list of English words. So, I'll show you the words. You'll have about 30 seconds, it depends how generous I'm feeling. Don't write anything down. I will then take the words away and you will write down what you remember. Got it? Okay. Will we go and write anything right now? Uh, no. Okay. This is not, uh, this is not worked because the words are not on the screen. Give me a... Okay, I'm going to say the words. And you're just going to have to remember what I've said, okay? Oh my god. Alright. Yeah. Let's see how good my memory is. <laughs> so I'm going to say some words, don't write anything down. Then I'm going to ask you what you remember. Okay? So, bed. Rest. Awake. It's a test for me as to whether I can remember the words. Peace. Nap. Blanket. Snooze, yawn, drowsy, awake, nuns. Okay, you have 30 seconds. Night. There's a freebie there for you. Which is that this is really giving me, like I said, I think of it as a game. 
But it's actually very serious, and you can imagine lots of scenarios where things like this really matter. So we do work in criminal justice, for instance, where if a judge or a jury was to falsely record something that didn't happen, that matters. If a doctor is diagnosing an illness, and they falsely record a symptom, that's super important. And there's all other kinds of uh, things that are uh, really important ways that this plays out in the world. So, what's going on here? What is behavioral insights? How do we explain it? Why did this just happen? Uh, so this guy, Daniel Kahneman, um, won a Nobel Prize. He very, very kindly basically distilled uh, all of his work into uh, this very, very simple way of thinking. So our brains operate on two systems, and this is the idea of dual process theory. So uh, we operate in two modes. We're either on system one, which is really fast, it's really intuitive, it's automatic. Uh, system one is essentially your autopilot. Uh, it helps you with all the things that are habits, um, things like driving a car, if you drive, um, things like two times two, you know, stuff that we just know by road, stuff that's ingrained, stuff that's, uh, that seems very simple and effortless to us. And then we have system two, which is this slow, reflective, deliberative, supercomputer kind of mode of being. And um, the problem, as Daniel Kahneman kind of outlines it, is that when we're thinking or planning or designing the world, so we're thinking about what should a policy look like, um, or how am I going to roll out this service? Because we're being very kind of thoughtful about it, we hugely overestimate how much time people are spending on system two. So we basically assume that people are these highly rational, very thoughtful supercomputers um, that are really kind of you know being reflective, deliberate, analytic at all times. And the truth is that most of the time we're on system one. And the reason for that is very simple: it's that it conserves energy. Uh, it leaves something in the tank for us later on in the day if we do have to make an important decision. And system one basically operates in this way by using rules of thumb. So here's some examples of the kinds of rules of thumb that it might use. The meta rule of thumb, the kind of overarching one that system one relies on, is if system one can handle it, don't even tell system two about it. Just don't bother system two. And so knowing this theory, and knowing that you know, we operate in this way, is not sufficient, and there's experimental evidence to show this, to stop us from doing this. Because system one will just kind of act as your spam filter, and things will never make it into your system two inbox. But here's some examples of the kinds of rules of thumb uh, that we use, and I'll give you some project-based uh, instances of where these have kind of played out in real life in a moment. So take the path of least resistance. If there's an easy way, take that. Um, unfortunately, you know, we all like to think that once we age out of being teenagers, uh, we've stopped just doing what everybody else does. Really strong, really dominant rule of system one is follow the crowd, and do what others do, whatever possible. And these are kind of, I'm, I'm painting these as though they're silly rules, right? But they actually serve incredibly well most of the time. So following the crowd, why would you kind of not do that? Why would you, um, you know, most of the time the reason that a crowd is doing something is that somebody else has already kind of worked out the best way to do things and everybody else is sort of following suit. There is no point in you kind of thinking, I'm going to pause and work out the optimal way myself. Uh, pay more attention to things that seem unusual. So my, um, uh, you know, this is basically mistaking things that uh, spring to mind easily for things that are likely. So my favourite example of this is when people go swimming in the sea. If you ask people how scared they've ever been of a shark attack, um, most people will say at some point they've been swimming in the sea and thought, Okay, maybe you know something's lurking under the water, but you ask most people how scared they are of uh, a drowning accident, and it doesn't occur to most people until they get into trouble in the water. But drowning, of course, is much more dangerous than uh, shark attacks on average. Um, worry about tomorrow's problems tomorrow. Um, so, you know, if it's happening in the future, we discount it very heavily. Um, uh, we don't worry about it until it comes. And then, this is one of my favourites, trust people who are likeable, good looking, who make you feel great about yourself, it doesn't matter if they're an expert, um, we trust people for the wrong reasons. Um, and all these things, you know, there's, there's a whole body of research that we call behavioural insights, um, all of this kind of empirical evidence from economics, psychology, sociology, anthropology, um, marketing, that kind of explains and uh, de-shrouds all of these different rules and shows us um, where they're operating and how we can work with them. So a lot of our work is working with the grain of human nature rather than trying to go against it. Okay, so what we're doing in our job at the Behavioural Insights team is we're trying to close these gaps. Um, so 
So we have these gaps between subjective judgment and objective reality. Uh, so here's an example of that. I'm not sure whether this will work, but if you look at um, these two grey boxes, subjectively, do they put your hand up if you think that they are different colours? Yeah. So, oh, so that's uh, that's just a matter of context. Sorry, I think these slides are now PDF, which means they get animation. But that's just a matter of uh, context. So you just have to believe me. Um, these two are actually the same colour. It's just that this is against a kind of darker reference point, and this is against a much lighter one. Um, so the way that we see, judge, and recall things massively depends on the context. And this is an optical illusion example, um, but this is also the case with things like false recall. All that sort of stuff. We try and close the gap between what people want to do in their kind of best, most rational moment uh, and what they actually do in reality. Um, so, one example here might be something like um, uh, using reusable drinking vessels. Um, people say they want to do it, people don't actually kind of end up doing it um, because things get in the way. Or what we should do what we actually do. So this is slightly different. We don't necessarily want to do this stuff, we just know that we ought to, we know it's good for us. So eating the healthy option um, over eating the unhealthy option. So these are the kinds of things we work on. And as I said, there's a whole body of literature that goes into this. And so we try and be really kind of um, simplistic with it. One of the things that I'll just say quickly is that we, we use randomized control trials uh, as well as a way of evaluating whether the stuff that we're doing is effective. And this is my favourite, you've heard a lot of examples of why, you know, why should we use randomised control trials. This is one of my favourites. So in the US, um, about two thirds of school districts use these fake robot babies um, <laughs> to teach kids about, this is not a robot baby, this is just a lovely cute robot um, to, to basically try and uh, deter, to, to deter young people from uh, teen pregnancy. And they're allegedly really, really good. They're these annoying things. They cry all night, robots, blah, blah, blah. And um, somebody uh, ran a randomized control trial on this. It turns out that uh, robot babies cause teen pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. We don't know what the mechanism is. It might be that your parents step in and look after the annoying robot baby. It might be that you think, oh, it's not that bad. Um, I mean, if you think it's really cute, I don't know. But, you know, the reality is that girls who have been given these robot babies were having more first pregnancies than those who were uh, in the years afterwards. So this is why we do RCTs. This is not a study of ours, I should say. Um, but this is why RCTs matter. And when we're talking about behavioural science, we try to distill it into these four really, really straightforward categories. So as I said, there's a whole body of literature. How do we kind of readily access it? So we talk about it in these terms, this is called our EAST framework. Um, if you want somebody to do something, make it easy, make it attractive, make it social, and make it timely. Uh, and in the time I've got left, I'm going to give you a very quick example of each of these. Some of these are studies that we've conducted, some of them are other bits of research that um, seem relevant. So making something easy, um, this can take, take a form of a lot of things. A lot of it is hassle factor. So even things that seem like, you know, tiny little barriers uh, to overcome can just stop people from, um, from taking action at all. Uh, so, you know, this is particularly interesting in relation to last mile problems and these kinds of things. There's also a really fascinating <coughs> set of research around defaults here. So what happens <coughs> uh, if you do nothing, if you don't take any action? So here's an example from um, Germany, actually. This is not an experiment that we ran. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a natural experiment that happened with an energy company in Germany. So they sent um, 150,000 people who were using their energy plans uh, a notice <coughs> saying, if you want to change your tariff, uh, your energy tariff, then you can uh, reply to this letter and let us know which tariff you would like. Now the tariff options were um, the one that they were defaulted into, the one that they received if they did not reply to the letter, was a green energy um, tariff, and it was sort of medium, medium priced. And the other options were um, a less green tariff that was much cheaper, or a greener tariff that was a, a little bit more expensive, um, or they could completely kind of switch out and not do anything. So if you assume that people probably have different preferences, some people want a cheaper tariff, some people want um, a greener tariff, you would imagine that there would be some degree of those preferences being expressed. Well, this is what actually happened. So two months after the switching option, 94% were 
were on the green red price default Sara, because you had to take action and respond to this letter, um, which is you know not super difficult, but people just weren't doing it. Green and more expensive, about one percent. Cheaper and less green, about four point three. This one I would have expect you would expect to be much higher because people should be price sensitive. The degree of people should be price sensitive, and even fewer people are changing supplier. So defaults really really matter, and they're incredibly powerful. And if you want somebody to do something you should preset the option that you want them to take as the default. So making stuff attractive, this is absolutely not about um, throwing money at the problem, giving people incentives, those kinds of things. This is about um, using some of those mental shortcuts, some of those rules of thumb that I described earlier, and working with the grain of human nature, what is going to make uh, this thing attractive to somebody. So we did, a, we did some experiments in the UK where we wanted people to choose vegetarian options. Um, over meat options, and um, specifically, we wanted to see what would, um, you know, what framing of a vegetarian option would make it more attractive. So the graph I'm going to show you shows the fraction of people who chose this item off the menu um, when they were given the option. And um, so people who aren't choosing this item would have chosen a meat item instead. So we have this vegetable dish. It's identically. People saw one of two versions of it. So they either saw meat free breakfast or they saw field grown breakfast, which sounds frankly quite disgusting, I think. Um, like, what's, a field, what's a field grown uh, sausage? I don't know. But people saw one of these two things and it bloody loved a field grown breakfast. <laughs> so, 30, you know, you, you get. Yeah, this is about you know what you would expect people to choose just based on vegetarians and choosing off the menu. Uh, you know this is close to double um, just from calling it a field grade breakfast. So these small things about how you frame the identical thing, how you make it attractive, uh, can have these really big differences. And again, we're using randomized control charts to evaluate the effectiveness of this. So making stuff social. This one's a little bit less intuitive, but this is basically recognizing that. The influences on people are not usually official figures. So, um, government or a service provider or whoever you're kind of an NGO, it's just a very small sliver uh, of somebody's existence. Uh, we want to use kind of social dynamics that they're already attuned to, the networks that they're already in, to try and get them to do stuff. Um, so, this was a study that we did in Denver, Colorado, just getting businesses to file their taxes online. What's quite interesting is when you ask these businesses um, why they might file online, they're all in Denver, Colorado, so they will tell you that they care loads about the environment and they're like super green. Um, so we tested these different messages to see what actually made businesses file online, which is a low carbon um, option. So the first message is this, go green, do it for the environment. Second message that people might have seen was don't waste your time and energy, it's way easier to do it online. And the third message is, most of businesses have got an online account, so basically using this idea that like everyone else is doing it, I'm not sure what you're fucking at. Um, <laughs> where are now working in a business setting? Um, so they care a lot about the environment, but it turns out that they actually care literally twice as much about what other people do. So this is 1.7% of these businesses went online um, in this round if you told them to go green, and 3.4% if you told them that um, everybody else was doing it. So again, these small things matter, and the thing I like about this is that what people tell us and what actually makes most people are two different things, so we always have to be kind of um, skeptical. And then lastly, making, uh, making things timely, um, which I think is ironic because I'm probably over um, So making stuff timely is about asking people to do things at the right time. One of my favourite examples here is a project that uh, UMDP ran with um, getting farmers in East Africa to buy fertiliser. Um, and they basically just changed the timing of allowing people to buy vouchers for fertiliser for the next season when they just had their money come in. And they found um, absolutely enormous spike in the number of farmers buying the vouchers because they were able to buy at the moment that they felt uh, essentially had enough, enough money to buy um, in a way that's consistent with what they wanted to do. So here's a completely different example. Um, Thinking about the moments that people might be more susceptible to habit change. So here's some work I did in Portland, in Oregon, in the US. Um, we wanted people to ride the shared bike uh, scheme, um, and we sent them these uh, uh, these vouchers essentially to say you can use this to ride on this bike, this bike share scheme. And we sent them to two different um, groups. So people who had a new bike station built near their house and people who had newly moved house to be near a bike station. So not, not necessarily 
Bean specifically, it's been in a buy station, but they believe it has. And what we found was that take up uh, was wildly different in these groups. Now, there might be differences between these groups that are not to do with um, us selling the match, right? But these are people who have a new facility built near them, a new bike dock built near them. And these are people who have newly moved house. Um, these are quite low take up rates, but this is essentially a social marketing campaign, so this is actually about what you would expect. Um, but what we think is going on here is that there are moments when people are way, way more susceptible to making change um, than other moments. And when you've just moved house and you have no routine, you have no habits, um, it's much easier to try something new and to take it on uh, than it would be otherwise. So, in summary, if you want somebody to do something, make it easy, make it attractive, make it social, make it timely. And specifically, just think about the tiny little moments that add up to make or break success along the course of your journey. So, um, you know, we've been doing the theory of change and thinking a lot about the big kind of end points and the end goals and the outcomes. But there's going to be a bunch of tiny little micro decisions that people have to make all the way along that process. And thinking about each of those through this lens, and when you're coming up with solutions, just betting them against, like, is this actually easy for people to do? Or if we don't want people to do it, can we make it harder for them to do? Um, are they going to find it appealing? Is it in line with social norms? Do, you know, would other people agree this is a good thing? Uh, and is it timely? Could we be asking them if they're likely to actually be able to comply or do this thing? Uh, so, yeah, I think, I don't know if we've got time for questions, but I'll be around uh, if not. Online and download a form, which is 
sort of ridiculous, but that's what they had to do. Um, but the letter directed them to the landing page, the website of the tax authority, and then they had to click through to the form. And we just changed the letter to direct them straight to the form, and it led to a 20% increase in actual payment of tax just by removing that one step, so removing that one, two additional clicks, which is ludicrous. But you know, thinking about those tiny frictions like that, and you can build the friction up if you want to make something a little bit more difficult, or you can kind of wrap it down. Um, you know, uh, so we call a lot of this a nudge, and it quite often gets called sludge when you deliver deliberately building friction. So nudge or sludge. Um, environmental education starts very early. I should start maybe earlier. Do you see age differences of how um, people react to nudges, so children reacting differently, more naturally somehow than adults who are formed by norms already? Yeah, so I think I wish I could take that question another another way. In that one of the kind of main takeaways that I should draw out is that we often we often don't think people will do something because it's good for the environment, um, even if they say that they will. This might not be true with kids. We don't do a ton of um, studies with kids in this particular domain. But you know, the tax example of uh, most people are filing their taxes this way compared to go green. Um, I think it's really interesting. That was an interesting project to work on because the people who commissioned us really wanted the message that worked to be go green because they wanted people to do it for the right reason. They wanted people to be bought in to do it because they wanted to help the environment. And we were saying, well, actually, does it matter why they're doing it? It just matters that they, uh, that they do it. And so often what we're trying to do is, is not appeal to people's rational, like, hey, you care about climate change, sort of um, cool state. We're trying to appeal to something that's a lot more kind of um, fundamental, I suppose, about how they, how they respond. So I would imagine that you would see differences in children and adults, but I wouldn't necessarily ever, um, I, would, I would imagine that most of the time the environmental message will do less well with a population that's not already highly sold on, on this. So Solomon gave us a few more minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So maybe yeah. you can ask her how do we make our project work, right? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's somewhere in line with that. Um, Just the mic, please, yeah. Uh, 
Yes, so um, that's exactly right. So we often think about this on the kind of, um, you know, if you have a distribution of people who may or may not do something, um, and you've got people who are generally doing it sort of roughly in the middle, we're really talking about the segment just to the, just to the kind of right of that. So people who are probably would, you know, do this stuff if only they remembered to get round to it, or, um, you know, if only they kind of knew how to do it, or if it was a little bit easier, or those kinds of things. So we're not, well, the, the, the examples I've given are not kind of fundamental, how do we shift an entrenched ideology. Um, we have done quite a lot of work, uh, which is, you know, a sort of different, um, a, a different end of this. We've done quite a lot of work that is on the more entrenched behaviours. So we do a lot of work on um, uh, upstream design and government policy, for example. So things like in the UK, we um, helped to redesign taxation, the taxation structure around sugary beverages. Um, so that we would take sugar out of the, um, essentially take sugar out of the food environment because we don't think that trying to nudge somebody in a supermarket to go for a less sugary drink is actually going to make any meaningful change in terms of obesity measures nationally. So we design, we often design policies at the top end through a behavioural lens, so what are people likely to do if we do this thing and we'll think about what would, in some, you know, what would drive manufacturers to reformulate rather than what would um, stop people at kind of bottom end. And then we do find that there are things that we can do to overcome what seem like very entrenched attitudes and kind of cultural norms. So there's a project that we're doing with the International Rescue Committee in a refugee camp in Tanzania where the goal of the project is to stop um, teachers in classrooms using formal punishment against children. And what we find with that project is that when you go and you talk to the teachers, it's very normal, it's considered acceptable, it's not really seen as a problem, even though the official rules of the camp say you're not allowed to hit, hit kids. And so, you know, there we're kind of working against a tide of a cultural norm. But what we found, we ran some initial studies and now we're running a big um, independently evaluated um, programme across the camp. What we found was that you could change people's mindsets around these things by changing the way that you framed um, the information. So, we had teachers look at um, a very rights and rules based uh, approach, which just says you absolutely shouldn't hit kids, it's very, you know, it's very bad, and it was the normal rules of the camp, versus getting them to do perspective taking and empathy and um, stance stuff. So, like, remember when you were a child, how awful it was when you got hit, how do you think you would feel? Would you be able to focus in class afterwards? Because a lot of what they were incentivized by was I used discipline to get respect in class. Um, so do you really think that child's going to be able to respect you afterwards and take, uh, you know, have some empathy uh, and to do some perspective taking? And we found that that, um, in the initial studies, massively reduced their tolerance for violence. So when we asked questions on, like, would it be, you know, what form of punishment would be acceptable in these situations, they were much less likely to give a violence-related answer if they've done, if they've taken that. <laughs> so we developed then this curriculum around that, which we now piloted, it looks like it's good, it's now being properly evaluated, but that, that's an example of something where we can shift attitudes that translate into behaviour, hopefully. Thank you very much, Martin. I think that was very inspiring.